How's everybody doing today? Great. Uh, maybe make some noise. Is this uh, whose uh, second box work is this uh, so far? Who's been here twice? Right. Very good. Uh, sorry, just a little bit of uh, feedback. I can't see if you raise your hand. It doesn't do anything. So you just this has to be noise oriented. So um, who's been to three box works? Very good. Four. Okay, I like this crowd. This is a good. This is a good region. I think you get special tickets if you come a few times. Well, we are. Uh, we're excited to have our best BoxWorks ever. Um, we have an incredible set of announcements um, and updates to share with uh, all of our customers and where we're going as a, uh, as a platform. Our mission at Box, and we're gonna dive into this more, is to uh, really power how the world works together. And, um, and we're incredibly excited to bring together so many customers from around the world. Maybe um, make some noise if you, if you flew into the US uh, for the conference, any of our uh, international friends in the, uh, in the event. Okay, very good, okay, good. Also very regionally focused, thank you. So um, we, uh, we're, we're excited to welcome thousands of customers uh, to BoxWorks this year. We have amazing partners. Um, please make sure to spend some time in our uh, partner pavilion. Um, we have amazing partners that um, are helping power the future of work uh, with Box and, um, and we're, where we are very aligned on the vision of, of where the world is going. And one of those uh, partners uh, that is incredibly important to us where we have uh, done a significant amount of work to help transform the workplace and collaboration and business processes in the cloud and with AI is IBM. And to kick off the conference, I'm incredibly excited uh, to welcome the chairman, president, and CEO of IBM, Ginny Rometty, uh, to come share a little bit about the vision uh, for IBM and how we're working together and what the future of work looks like. Ginny, how's it going today? It's morning. Okay. Has, but you're on East Coast time. Have you been up for like nine hours? Not quite, but yes. Okay, yes. all right. Um, I just woke you, up like You sound like you've been up nine hours. I, that's just all the coffee. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, it's actually probably been more like 45 minutes. Okay. Um, but um, so, Jenny, welcome to BoxWorks. Uh, we, uh, we're incredibly excited to have you here. And um, I've actually been, I don't know if you know this, I've, I'm in your inbox about uh, for the past five years each year. Um, I've been trying to get you to come, and I think we could make this work this time. So that, I that do, is true. I do appreciate you, you making it out. So, Jenny, I think um, IBM is a, an incredible story to watch. Obviously, one of the world's largest uh, technology companies, one of the most storied businesses on the planet. And you've been trans, uh, transforming the, the business model, how you work with customers, the technologies that you're invested in. Maybe if you could just step back and just give us a state of the world around what that transformation has been like. And then we'll get into what does this mean for customers, what does this mean for the future of IT, and, 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 and all the, I think, the business transforming, transformation that we're seeing right now. Yeah, well first, um, thank you for having me here. Yep. And it is true, Aaron's tried, and it just was a schedule thing. It wasn't that you had to try hard. I'm positive that that's okay. all it was, that, yes. It is, <laughs> and so. Uh, a lot of people tell me that. Yeah. I just have a calendar, it's a problem, don't yep. worry about it. So my pleasure to now be here, and because so many clients here are IBM clients, so I thank you for that just to start. And uh, I, I think IBM's transformation which is still ongoing, like I think everybody out here is pretty similar to what everyone in the room has gone through. And I, I'm preparing, we're about to have a big CEO conference and we've been doing interviews of every one of them uh, for their big bets. So we've done this a couple years in a row, so it's interesting to watch. And the only reason I bring it up is, I really do feel we're a reflection of each other. Mm -hmm. So everyone in the audience in that, if you look where everyone is, everyone will say, yep, I'm on a digital, digital journey, digital transformation, you pick your words, everybody says it. True, um, the next piece, and I suspect, especially with this audience, what was true five years ago, that yes, data is important, data is important, I think people really believe that data is their competitive advantage, yep. they can do something. Does, does this group, is this a believer of that? that Anybody it, agree that data is important in the future? For okay. your, uh, I mean, <laughs> but, but even not just important, that's kind of a corny question, but that it's really gonna be the differentiator yep. for your company. Um, in fact, I know there's probably, Startups and anybody who clap if your company's over five years old. Okay. okay. How about under five years old? Okay. Okay. They're they're the, they're they're here. They're okay. here. <laughs> we so, got everybody. All right, so we got. Well, wait, actually, actually, and clap if you're over fifty years old as a company. Wow. All right. Okay. All right. So we so got everybody. We're, we're going to come back okay. to that a couple times because we're going to do a lot of clap surveys today. No, no, no. <laughs> Aaron and I were talking about that. And the only reason I asked it was, I, I sort of had coined this phrase, the incumbent disruptor, uh. that you know, 80% of the world's data belongs to you. So it's a matter of whether you really can do something with it, which is what I know people in this room spend a professional life trying to make happen for their companies. And if you can, and in fact, back to this survey we are doing right now, two years ago, yeah. people were afraid of 
new companies coming in and now they're afraid of actually their existing competitors yep. getting really good with data. Yep. So you can see this sea change out there. And so I think everybody's gone through this. Yep. Um, I, would, uh, I would also describe two other things I think happening. I think all of us have been through what I would call chapter one. So chapter one of the digital transformation happened, go back a few years, new startups, new things everywhere, how do you combat? Look, you do a lot of customer facing change. And I think mm. a ton of customer driven innovation, customer front ends, customer facing apps were done. Mm -hmm. And easy things you could move to the cloud, you move to the cloud. That to me was chapter one, kind of outside in if I can say it that way. And perfect, but the other thing I now notice, and maybe you're grappling with it, I got a lot of clients that say, this is good, but now I also have this thing called random acts of digital everywhere. <laughs> they are everywhere and they're not connected. And the other good thing, I mean, I was looking at some work we were doing with Geico. I've done these wonderful front ends, and now they bash into these back ends can, yeah. that are pretty brittle, and they don't move on the same time frame the front does. Enter chapter two. So I think we are all in this chapter two now, where I would call it inside out, because now I gotta change the mission critical work, break it up, microservices, move things. I believe hybrid cloud, we'll talk about that yep. for lots of reasons. And it's to now make inside out, data driven, mission critical, break it into components, so it can be as, as flexible as the front ends. So I feel together we're in chapter two now, it's harder, it's like 80% of the now cloud journey to go, and it is really about data, workflows, mission critical apps, and that's where we're at right now. And, and it's interesting actually, because um, if you, if you in, that, in that sort of um, way of describing it, you, the sort of the, the first phase is. Outside in, uh, the other one inside out. Uh, outside in, and my customer's gonna, gonna sort of get this great digital experience, but I haven't yet become a digital company. I don't look right. like the speed or agility of a small startup. And in your inside out change, that's like the business is becoming more agile. You don't have to worry, you're not just responding to one particular threat today, you're building a sustainable cultural change in your organization no matter what the future threat is or where the market goes. Yeah. And actually, now just to maybe jump to, to IBM on that, I mean, you've had to do a lot of cultural change internally around. I know there's been a, a huge push toward agility and speed of innovation. How has that overall transformation then gone? Yeah, so look, I think, again, I have to, I believe in some ways, I think we mirror many of the people in the right. room. And that um, when I think of our own transformation ongoing, so part of it's been a portfolio change. And that's probably what people talk the most about. Yep. Um, but I would say two other things are even more important, which I'll come back to, which I think this audience focuses a lot on. So the, but the first on the portfolio change, what we are trying to do, because we are really cognizant that what we do is mission critical work. But I'm part of your past, and I have to be part of your future and give you a bridge between those. And so it's been a big journey about now, hybrid cloud, and then cognitive enterprise. Now cognitive, I know, um, it's a favorite word for many people, I am sure. <laughs> but this idea of an AI-driven company where it's data-driven, AI-infused workflows, you know, outward to clients, and that's a cognitive company. So we've, we've, those are a yin and a yang to us. So on one hand, we built out now, it has taken us some time to build out the hybrid cloud. Um, this is why we bought Red Hat. Yep. Do you mind if I talk one minute about Do that it. part? If, yes, um, please. So, I think, I think if you spend $35 billion buying anything, you can talk about it for okay. as long as you want. Yeah. I, think so, uh, that's, I think that's just like the rule. So. <laughs> it is a rule. Yeah. And so, um, but actually very fair price for it. I so, agree. Uh, so let's, uh, he agrees. I didn't buy him. I mean, what? No, but I, as, a, as a bystander of the internet, you would I, like that I, I, I valued it the same way. Mm. So. So, so back to, um, back to the point. So uh, on, the, <laughs> uh, on the portfolio, but let me just, when I think of transformation, three big pieces, and I'd like to eventually, I hope Aaron and I get time to talk about the second two, but one's your portfolio of your company like you are. The second though, I actually think is the underserved point, which is to really change a company, you gotta change how work is done. Yep. And Box fits at the center of this too. And that to me has been the part, as I always say, the book I'll never write, but it is the piece that has been the most profound for IBM was to change how work was done. And then the third piece is around the people and the skills. Yep. But, but back to portfolio for a minute. And um, so this cognitive enterprise, hybrid cloud. The reason I think hybrid cloud is really everyone's future, it's for a couple different reasons. Um, you guys clapped if you were not born yesterday. And even if you were born yesterday, I'll come back to that. So it's like a house, you're gonna remodel your house. 
um, unless you have infinite money, you don't knock it down and rebuild the whole thing overnight. You're going to look at all your workloads and you're going to say, you know what? Some of these I'm not going to invest in. I should just let them run. Some of these are going to be a private cloud, multiple. Mm -hmm. Some of these can go to Amazon, some to Google, some to the IBM cloud, some to Salesforce, some to Box. And before you know it, this is a hybrid cloud. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, we did a survey. Clients have between five and 15 clouds already. Yep. And many will say they have two. They have between five and 15 already. So now I have a data and a security issue. Then I go into certain countries and they demand certain things to happen certain ways. So that's in effect what a hybrid cloud is. So we also had to work hard to prepare ourselves. We had to build the IBM cloud and then we built it again to be entirely open source in Linux containers, Kubernetes native. So that's rolling out now. The second piece that we had to do with the IBM private cloud, so private public, and then the hybrid is recognizing you'll be not always on ours, you'll be on others as well. We've modernized all of our software to run on Red Hat OpenShift, which runs anywhere now, so software anywhere, and we bought Red Hat. And the idea with Red Hat is, I think everybody would agree, those of you in the audience that focus on technology standards, it is Linux containers, Kubernetes. I think that war is over. That is the standard for the next era. Perfect. Certainly if you're at this conference. Yes. I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, no, I, I, by the way. But globally also. Globally, I yep. mean, servers yep. in the world, yep. uh, they have tipped over this last year, over 50% are yep. Linux. Right. And that's increasing at four points a share a year. Mm. And Red Hat is the number one provider. And they make it safe for the enterprise. Right. So the idea, if you're in the room, um, and why I believe so strong in hybrid, and why Red Hat is A, skills are your big issue. This allows you to build once, decide where to run, run anywhere. Second point, it gives you independence. You can build something, you can run it on-prem, in anybody's cloud, you can move it. And this is gonna really be an issue for you in the future. Aaron and I were talking about this with people's workloads and the separation of data. And then the third thing is, unless you're able to hire all the smart people in the world, you now have access to all the open source innovation. So yep. those are the big three reasons for hybrid cloud. And then our other big part of our portfolio investment's been in AI. And it's been a recognition that, again, you may use Watson, but you can use lots of things. And if I can just throw one other thing, that so much of the people in this room I know work on how to really bring data and AI to life in their company. Having been one of the really early ones out of the gate on this, I feel you know we've taken a number of the arrows and lots of learnings. And the biggest issues have been, one, um, to really get AI to work in a company, you gotta change the workflow. Yep. If you don't change how work's done, that is this sprinkling of dust, and it's so frustrating for so many companies. They're like, I didn't really get the return. The second thing is 80%, 70% of the time is spent on the data. Yep. Okay, so that's another frustration piece around it. And then the third, which I hope we talk about, is the trust, the trust in what you get. We learned that very first with doctors. If you just gave them an answer, well, it's true with any professional. The first question they ask is, why? Right. And if you can't answer that, nobody wants to trust it. Right. My first answer is no. So, yours is no? I just, can't no. be true, right? Yeah. No. As a guy who sells data stuff, that's <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I shouldn't be selling answer. that point. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So, so, the, so the transformation of IBM has been about hybrid cloud and then data. And what, um, let, let's maybe then, um, so, I, so very briefly on open source, IBM has had a very actually long history supporting open source. And, and so um, on one hand, everyone was like, holy shit, like Red Hat, big open source company. On the other hand, it's like actually this natively sort of, I think, um, uh, is, is already tied to the, the, the mission of, of IBM. How, how do you think about open source and, and continue to make that investment? Well, look, for, so um, how many people are open source fans in the room that believe that? Okay, front of room. I don't yeah. know. I, I'm listening we, we, to the. Yeah, I think we. Um, I think uh, people in the back like proprietary technology. Is that what so, it is? Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> no. So the uh, look. I think the idea on open source. For those of you that clapped. I mean, it is that you have access to tons of different innovation done by large groups of people. If you didn't realize, IBM was one of the very first really initiators of Linux. We put a billion dollars into it 20 years ago, God, and that's God. really what partly started Red Hat and the like back then. And so. There is a piece, we are the number one, two or three contributor to most of, you probably didn't know that, to most of the big open source projects that are out there. And so therefore, it's a strong commitment that there is a lot of innovation, and now we've standardized on it um, in the company. And so, very strong belief in it. And by the way, for those of you that do use Red Hat, we, this is why we've left them as a separate entity, in part because they need to be neutral, they need to be able to run on everybody's cloud, everybody's products, no problem. But what we can do for them is not only extend their reach, 
this is all about, we want more open source certified, yep. certified, certified running on there. Because many of you do know, you know, they do the last mile. They harden it, they make sure it's secure, they back test it, multiple versions, every, the world, everything that you're used to. Yep. And those that take their own risk on open source that isn't been certified like that, there have been many news articles about what happened to those, some of those companies. Yep. And so when they venture out. So strong commitment to it, and it is really around the two points. Of, for, so you get interoperability that we think you need and access to innovation. What, um, so, so in a world of uh, mass amounts of data, you know, moving from your enterprise, touching the customer, new, employee, new customer experiences, new employee experiences, AI-driven workflows, um, obviously the security, the privacy of that data becomes front and center. And, yeah. it's, and it's, we're obviously, uh, you know, the past couple of years, especially Silicon Valley with consumer companies have been dead center at that story of what's the future of privacy. And it's your job and it's our job to make sure that enterprises in any, you know, or in, in any industry are able to protect and secure their information so they can adhere to the various laws and privacy requirements. How do you see sort of trust generally right now in the state of technology? Uh, what, what is IBM doing about enabling and, and furthering that trust? What, what do you think we are in the state of the world on this? Okay, so how, how many, I, I would say that trust could be the defining issue of our time yep. in lots of ways. How, can I get another clap? How many people find they're spending time, privacy, security, trust, in the world you live in today? So, okay, that got the most, cla yeah, most yeah, claps okay, of everything. Right? We, we have a consensus on that one. Yep, no, no, I, and I, I really, for anybody in the room, um, I look at why are we 108 years old? Not me, we. <laughs> and uh, don't, don't, don't be voting on that. And so I do believe it's because those of us that have stuck around that long, you trust us, that, you, that we aren't going to do something with that data. And it's been at the heart. Never put back doors in, never gave it to governments, you know, all of that kind of thing. And so defining issue of the time, and therefore, I would, can I, I would recommend three things if you're not doing them. Um, the one is, and it made us write these down even though I felt we'd lived by them, we wrote down our policies mm. around trust and transparency. We, this was maybe six years ago, wrote them down, and the, not only write them, you gotta audit yourself against your own stuff, every, and you gotta keep doing it and keep doing it, because people can veer off of these things. For us, real quick, those th the three principles were the purpose of technology is to augment what mankind does. The second one is data belongs to its owner, as do its insights without their permission not to be used. And then the third thing is these technologies must be explainable or they will never be trusted. Mm -hmm. And so, so one is to audit yourself on those. And if you, if you don't have any principles, I'd invite you to write them and you know, publish them. And, and the biggest thing is always testing your living to them. Second one would be your products. Everybody in here does something, a service. Can you make it come alive in your product? So, you know, we have something called Open Scale, and it was this recognition that you need a platform for life cycle of data and models, no matter whose AI it came from, and can it test for fairness and bias? Now, you know, bias is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, you, there's good bias, bad bias. It, it kind of represents ethics of mankind. What we might call bias in our country or in our democratic values may be different somewhere else. So this, this is kind of blind to it and it looks for any patterns that would be signals of a, of a bias of any kind. So it, it comes alive in a product or, you know, believe it or not, I mean, the mainframe is alive, kicking and growing and all, by the way, cloud native in its most recent announcement. And what we built in it was encryption everywhere, mm. data in the machine, but anywhere the data goes out and to anyone it goes to, back and forth, which would have stopped the most recent big breach you'd seen if they'd used that. And mm. so that's the put it in your products. Make it people, you can't say to people, well, you should have took care of that. I think you got to put it in your products. And then the third, if I might, this is perhaps the one um, I, I think if we all work on together, the third issue on trust, I think has to do with preparing people to live in this digital era. Mm. That if we don't do something, this is not going to be an inclusive era. You, this is true in every country. In the United States, all the riches cannot go to the west and the east coast. If people look at the future and say, you know, this is great, this technology, but like I don't have a better job, and this isn't going to be good for me, and this is why you get Brexit, this is why every country I go into. And so I think in this era of trust, it's our jobs to get people prepared, and, and 
I really feel as a company, if I'm gonna build this technology, I gotta bring it in safely into this world. And therefore, um, I'll give you one quick example. We're working with 500 other companies on the idea that you don't have to have a four-year degree to live in this digital era and have a good job. And we kind of coined something called new collar. Not, so there's no negative blue collar, white collar. It would be that you could get a really great paying job, cloud, security, data. And we went to some of the poorest performing four-year high schools. I'll end to the story now, because we've been at it six years. 500 companies working with us. Um, They're called new collar kids, P-Tech schools. They are a four-year high school, two-year community college. You get an associate degree. It was very easy. This is not about technology, because I think we all know it's about people's propensity to want to learn. And so these kids are graduating at 400x times community college mm. rate. 15% of my hiring in the United States, and I'm really big, wow. was this last year. Wow. And so, um, but I, I welcome, I mean, if, if you don't want to do anything else with us, send me a note if your company wants to just jewels. And so that's one end. The other other end of the spectrum is apprenticeships because yep. folks who are further in their careers. So my, I know it's a bit of a long answer on trust. I do think it is around your policies, it is around your products or service, and it is yep. around people. And it's that you make this an inclusive era. I, I, I do think, that's why I think trust is a defining, this is a defining moment for us that people feel there's a good way forward. And do you think governments are, um, I mean, do, how do you think regulation plays out? And, and you know, most, yeah. of this, most of this room is, is sort of, you know, companies that are leveraging technology to create differentiation and, and, and competitive advantage. And so this is gonna hit everybody if we have, you know, balkanization of privacy laws and all these new challenges that we're, we're seeing emerge. How many people get involved in regulation? Oh, <laughs> they're like, it's an awkward uh, thing I don't to like for, it. Actually. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. I want to right um, now, I don't know. No, yeah. the, if I can, I think it would help if we'd all stand up for something. Um, yeah. A, there should be consistent consumer privacy regulation in this yes. country. I am that's very, that, that's well, okay. if you, let me describe what I mean why. Because okay. California's got its, its yep. law that it presented. But for your companies, can you, or the consumer, start there. Can you imagine if every state came up with different <laughs> rules? I mean, this would be a disaster. Yeah. And even Europe managed to get something consistent across it. So the first order is a consumer does have the right to know what data you have, how it's being used, yep. be deleted, et cetera. I think that is for sure what to happen. But the next piece, when, when Aaron was asking me about regulation, um, many of us also are B2B or we do other things in that I've been such a strong advocate on precision regulation because having worked with so many legislators around the world, they don't understand the difference between consumer and business to business. So you could put a scratching halt on the digital economy mm -hmm. so that you couldn't even send your own company data across borders. I mean, this would be crazy. Yep. And so there should be a free flow of data. I mean, and there are countries, those of you that are international, I spent time with Prime Minister Modi last week, and this is my one point with him. You have to let the free flow of data happen. And there are many countries looking to you know, localize data now, and they're gonna unintentionally completely hurt their own GDP, by the way. So, yeah. um, so I believe in that kind of precision regulation and really aimed at where there's been misuse, because otherwise everyone's gonna pay a tax that is completely and unproductive. Are you optimistic that, that we get to that level of universal well, data privacy? I am, I am optimistic other countries are getting there. Okay, yep. I guess I'm optimistic <laughs> at the last minute we'll get there. Okay, okay so that's... We'll join uh, eventually. I think we're gonna, there's a lot of work we're working on it. Those of you, um, there's something called the Business Roundtable with a couple hundred of the country's uh, leaders on it that really does work to get policy that we all need. This is one of the big points that we're really advocating is a consistent consumer policy right now in the country. And it's it's like timely now. Yeah, that's awesome. And one of the things that we're, we're doing in partnership is uh, really thinking about what does the future of data security in a in a modern workplace. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to bring the best of box for collaboration and modern workflows, the best of IBM from a security compliance data governance standpoint, and make sure that we can enable our customers to stay as secure as possible in this new digital age. Yeah. So with that, um, I really appreciate the, the partnership. We're incredibly excited to continue to go and, and transform how our customers work together. And, um, and looking forward to, uh, to hopefully having you solve all of our, our global issues. No, no, this um, is a yeah. together thing. No, no, this That's is just you. A, yeah. I, we're gonna put this on you. <laughs> you, you know more, way, way more uh, prime ministers, um, so yeah, yeah, you're gonna yeah. have to, this is all on you. Sorry. 108 years okay. old. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thanks Jenny. Thank you, Eric. Uh, 
it's been it's been fantastic to uh, t to partner with IBM uh, as they continue to transform the enterprise, and we have a lot of really great uh, joint product development and, and product innovation um, that uh, that you can leverage today, and way more to come as well that we'll continue to be sharing with the market. Um, so uh, we uh, we're very excited about the partnership. At Box, um, and many of uh, many of you know this, we talk about it every year. Our mission is to power how the world works together. Uh, our unending focus is this idea of in a digital age. People are going to want to share and collaborate and work on information on any device at any time from any location anywhere around the world uh, in a very secure way, in a way that you can trust, in a way that keeps your data private and, and, um, uh, and secure as possible where you have control. So that um, is uh, certainly more and more core to our mission when you think about what's going on in the world today. Um, I'm incredibly excited about this uh, conference and uh, BoxWorks in particular because we get to spend time with all of our customers. Uh, Box today now has 95,000 customers in 69% of the Fortune 500. So we're incredibly excited about the progress um, that we've been able to drive. And again, it's due to all of you um, and so many more people around the world that are really thinking about how are they going to how are they going to transform the way they work, the way they operate uh, in the cloud and. Um, what's really exciting about our, our jobs at Box is we get to work with customers in a range of industries, small, medium businesses, some of the largest enterprises in the world in every single industry, life sciences, healthcare, financial services, transportation, every single industry that is being impacted and touched by digital transformation. So um, first of all, just a huge thank you uh, to all of our customers and, and our partners for being able to make this happen. What? What, what I think what we see uh, from our customer base, and, and frankly, the customer bases of, of the general cloud community and the, the transformation that we're seeing is um, that what, what is most common is we have a, 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 an overriding desire to simplify how we work and to be able to transform and accelerate our businesses. How do we make sure that in the digital age, we can be as competitive as possible, we can enable employee experiences, where employees can be as collaborative and productive as possible, and where the enterprise can uh, deliver the best experiences for customers, whether you're a B2B company, uh, a B2C company, uh, or a government, uh, or a nonprofit. So how do we transform the way that we work with our customers as well as the way that we work internally? And this year has been really exciting because, again, we've made significant progress of working with um, our customers that are trying to, to transform. We were um, incredibly excited to announce a, a, a partnership with Morgan Stanley that's um, all about tra transforming how they collaborate with their clients. So the ability to move off of paper or more manual processes and do all of that collaboration in the cloud securely uh, in a very efficient and easy to use way. So um, really exciting to see the, the, uh, all of the momentum in financial services and the transformation that we're seeing. In life sciences, we're really proud to work with organizations like Eli Lilly, Amgen, Allergan, AstraZeneca, and many others that are transforming the way they do everything from research to bring new medical discoveries to life uh, to customers to really improve the daily lives of millions and billions of people all around the world. And we're also incredibly excited to work with so many amazing uh, nonprofits or government uh, organizations that are transforming our everyday lives. Organizations like NASA that are reaching completely new limits um, because of the ability to collaborate, access data, and work in an incredibly secure and efficient way. So again, we just uh, are incredibly proud and, and so excited to be able to work with so many of you on all the transformation that you're driving. But what's exciting, again, about being in a fast-moving industry and being able to be in the cloud in 2019 is we're so early on this journey. We are at the earliest stages of seeing how businesses are going to continue to change. I think the first era of the cloud was how do we take workloads, how do we take infrastructure, how do we take applications, how do we take data, how do we move it into a more modern, more efficient, more secure way of, of operating. But in so many ways, both Box and this industry is just at its very earliest stages. And we know, based on the lessons of the past couple of years, whether it's about security or privacy or where tech uh, can have a, good, a positive or negative impact on the world, we know that there's still so much more work left for us to do. And at Box, the thing that we get excited about is being able to continue to go along this journey with our customers and transform and power the way that we work in this process. When we look at the world today, and I think this is, I, I think this is gonna resonate for everybody in this room, we know that work is fundamentally changing. The way that we work today looks completely different 
than what it did five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and beyond. We know that, that the way, the style that we work, how we collaborate, how agile we are, what devices we're working from, all of this is completely changing. I mean, literally yesterday, Microsoft announced a device using Android. Everything is fucking changing right now. So this is, this is a, an incredible time to be in technology. It's an incredible time to be thinking about what the future of work is going to look like. And at Box, what, what we get really excited about, and when we see how much is transforming in the enterprise, we, we think about three really, really big things that are changing. And this is what you're going to see our product uh, be unbelievably focused on. The first is that we know that your business processes, all of our business processes, now depend on people and, and teams inside and outside of our organization. It used to be that maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, a small percentage of our business processes were external in nature. We, the, the whole focus was how do we get as much optimization, as much scale as possible within the four walls of our business. And now, whether it's contract work, it's on-demand partners, it's the ability to collaborate across a global supply chain, every single industry is being impacted by the ability to ha have work be done across their organizations and across their enterprises. This is true in life sciences, in financial services, in governments, in manufacturing, and so much more. And so we have to think about the world in a completely different way. Yes, we have to think about our employees, we have to think about the internal IT environment that we have, but now we have to think about how does that connect to my supply chain? How does that connect to my customers? How do I deliver these experiences that, that work across my entire ecosystem? So that's the first really, really big change that we're seeing increase over the past couple of years. The second is that we know that our people, our teams, the individuals in our organizations, demand intuitive, modern ways to work. And importantly, those ways that we work in, in the applications we're using have to work together. We are no longer in an era where you can buy all of your technology stack from one or two or three or five vendors. Even what Ginny was saying with the number of clouds, referring to public cloud infrastructure, there are now so many more pockets of innovation that we're seeing that we now need, are bringing into our organization. Now when you expand that out to all of SaaS, we work with customers that have 50 or 100 or 200 applications within their enterprise. I'm sure that's, that's actually lowballing a lot of different organizations here, where we have so many different applications that people are working from. And so it's incredibly important, on one hand, to make sure that we're giving employees choice and we're letting them use the best technology that is fit for purpose for the business processes that they're powering, but and incredibly importantly, those technologies have to work together. We have to make sure that our technology interoperates. We have to make sure that we're delivering seamless experiences when we're leveraging these best in class or best of breed technologies. And later today, we're incredibly excited. We're gonna have a panel with many of the leaders in the best in, te uh, best in class technology space in the cloud to talk about what we're doing from an interoperability standpoint. And then finally, and where this all comes to a head in all of our organizations, if we're working with so many people in and outside of our enterprise, and we're collaborating on data, and data is the object, and data is the, 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 what's flowing between our organizations, and people want to be able to use tens or hundreds of more applications inside of the organization, all of a sudden security is a completely new ch challenge for us. Right? We can't secure the four walls of our enterprise in the way that we did five or 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. We can't just add only network security to the problem, and we can't just block the information that's flowing in and outside of our business. Because fundamentally, that information is what is powering our business process. We have to be able to move data in and outside the enterprise. This is not an if, this is, this is a how. And so the question is, how do we keep our enterprises as secure as possible, where we can control the data to make sure only the right people have access to this information, and yet still be able to collaborate effectively, be able to work from anywhere, be able to make sure that people can use the applications uh, that they need to run their business. And so, we believe that the way that we collaborate, the way that we secure, the way that we manage our information is at the heart of this future of work. And it's no surprise that we tend to believe that, that uh, we're gonna deliver uh, a pretty different experience than the rest of the market. We don't think that existing technologies can fully solve this problem. On one hand, we have more of the legacy solutions, the document management, legacy content management systems that we think are hard to use. They don't let you collaborate effectively outside the enterprise. They tend to be too rigid and costly to be able to update, so it's a lot of extra work and a lot of extra expense to be able to manage these technologies. And we also believe that more of the consumer apps, the personal storage tools, also can't help us work in this modern way. 
They're fine for my personal and individual access to data, but they don't connect up to my business processes. They don't allow me to stay secure in a regulated industry. They don't allow me to control my data in the ways that I need as an enterprise. And so when we look at this problem, we say, there's so much transformation happening in the enterprise. Our business processes are changing completely, and yet we don't have enough uh, innovation in this space to be able to completely change the way that people work in a secure way. And that is what we're focused on at Box. So we've introduced this idea of cloud content management. It's one platform for secure content management, workflow, and collaboration integrated into all of the applications that you're using. Some of those applications are going to be powered by key partners. Some are going to be the ones that you build yourselves that we saw in the example of Morgan Stanley, which is transforming its client collaboration uh, using our, 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 our uh, platform APIs. But our focus is how do you have one source of truth, one place to manage and secure data integrated into the rest of your business. That is what cloud content management is all about. And today, we're incredibly excited to share more about our vision for where the future of cloud content management is going and where the future of work is going to be evolving because of this. And we have some exciting both announcements today as well as updates around key product areas that I know that many of you are going to be very excited to hear about. So with that, I'd like to bring up G2 Patel, our chief product officer, to share a bit more about what we're doing to transform and simplify the way that you work. Well, everyone, how is everyone doing? Wow, this is a great audience. So, um, you know, I've been, uh, this is my fifth BoxWorks, and I've been working with Aaron now for four years, and it's been such a pleasure. The only thing that I have a beef with him on is he's just a low energy kind of guy. So, so um, uh, we should try to try see if we can work on that for them. Um, so, uh, we're really pumped to be here. Uh, we're going to share with you some great innovations that we have, but before we get started, I got some news that I thought I'd start with first. Um, so that I can make sure that we start off on, um, on an amazing note. Uh, so, uh, uh, you guys ready? All right, so last, this past year, um, all the leading analysts conducted studies in this market where they compared everyone. And the great news is, um, you know, Gartner, Forrester, and IDC rated Box a leader in the marketplace for this. So. We had a little bit of a physics problem, though, because um, it's really hard to put all the studies we realized where we were the leader on a single slide. And so for those that can't see in the back, we got a little bit of a zoom. <laughs> so um, once again, thank you to all the customers who actually advocated for us, and thank you to uh, the analysts who actually run, ran such a thorough study. So. Um, you know, from our perspective, if you take a step back, this new era of content management and collaboration uh, in the cloud is built with three key principles. And um, uh, the first and most important principle, and Jenny talked about this a little bit, is this notion of frictionless security and compliance. And the, um, the thing over here to keep in mind is in the frictionless security and compliance side, it's the, mo the best way to build an insecure system in your organization is to build a really secure system with a really poor experience because what people do is just go around it, right? And so that's the first key area of, of that's the first key principle we keep in mind. The second key principle which, that, which it feeds into is we eventually have to get work done in this kind of very, very complex, fast-changing world. And there has to be a seamless way of going out and engaging with people for collaborating, for conducting business process automation, for doing workflows that are both internal within your organization as well as people that are outside the organization. And the third key principle is that all of these things don't just happen in a siloed application. You have multiple clouds in your organization. You have multiple applications that you're going to be working with. And you need to make sure that your content layer can go out and effectively integrate with all of those applications. So, you know, so um, those are three kind of core principles. And we'll talk to you today about innovation that we're making in each one of these three areas. Um, and I think you're going to love it. So uh, let's start with the first one, which is frictionless security and compliance. And if you think about frictionless security and compliance, Box has always been providing frictionless security and compliance in the cloud, in fact, for the past you know, 12 years or so. And this starts with our core infrastructure. We've actually built a very resilient, scalable, secure, compliant infrastructure in the cloud. Uh, and that's what customers um, have, have really learned to rely on. And then on top of that infrastructure that was built, we built some really interesting capabilities around security and compliance over the course of the past decade and a half. 
Uh, and those, those capabilities include things like um, governance, where you can make sure that you can have a certain number of retention policies that are applied to your content, a disposition policy so you don't keep your content for too long within the organization, or have legal holds when you actually have um, you know, a, a, s some sort of subpoena that's there and you need to make sure that you can produce that content for a discovery. Uh, you have zones capabilities so that you can have in-region data in different parts of the world for regulations that you might need to have there. We talked about privacy. You want to make sure that you can maintain the encryption keys within your organization for content that's going to be in the cloud. We actually provide a product called KeySafe. So those are all the kind of capabilities we'll, we've, we've built. And then what, what builds on top of that is for every industry, every geography, our goal is to make sure that we can provide the right level of compliance certification. So if you're in the healthcare industry and you want HIPAA certification, or if you happen to be in the uh, financial services industry, you want FINRA certification. If you happen to be in the government industry and you want, you, you want FedRAMP certification, we actually provide those capabilities uh, for every industry, every geography within the, 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 the core base platform for content management. And then lastly, you've made a lot of investments in these different kinds of providers that provide you with security and compliance capability. And we want to make sure that you can further those investments. So we deeply integrate and partner with each one of those investments as you move forward as well. So as a result of this, what you're starting to see is a lot of sensitive content is actually moving to the cloud. And this is a really interesting dynamic that's happened over the course of the past four years or so, four, four or five years. But, pri but five years ago, the big concern that organizations had was they didn't want to use the cloud because they weren't feeling safe about moving the content to the cloud. Today, what you're starting to see is a lot of our organizations that come to us actually move their most sensitive workloads to the cloud first, because sometimes they feel like the security posture that Box has in the cloud is far safer than what they can go out and implement on-prem. And so that's a really, really interesting kind of dynamic that's happened over the course of the past few years. And if you look at this, this dynamic, it's not just isolated within one industry or one geography. You're starting to see it pretty horizontally spread across multitude of different industries and geographies. And so there's sensitive data in banking, in th whether it be financial services records, uh, or life science where you might have a drug formula or clinical, or, or clinical trial data, or in media and entertainment where you might have a movie script. These are all kind of core pieces of sensitive intellectual property that are being moved to the cloud. And that's essentially what's happening across every industry with very, very few exceptions, if at all any. Now, if you take a step back, and say, how does this actually um, work? And how do people work with this sensitive content in the cloud? The way that it works right now is users have devices that they log into, which have applications that access content. Right? Now, the challenge is, this is where it gets really interesting, because the challenge is users can be both internal and external. You might have people that are employees within your organization, or you might have people that are outside the organization that are now logging into devices that might be both managed and unmanaged. You might have devices that actually have a corporate disk image on it, or you might have your personal device that you might be using to access sensitive content, which might not even have basics like disk encryption enabled. Um, that's now going out and accessing content that's both um, um, happening from applications that are custom applications, uh, or it might be third-party applications. And some of these might be uh, too risky to handle your sensitive content. And lastly, the content itself can be sensitive or it can be malicious. And so when you start looking at how enterprises work, there's tens of thousands of enterprises um, that are actually kind of facing this problem. And the way that you start to see this happen is you take a typical enterprise. You have a typical enterprise that might have, let's say, you know, thousands of users or tens of thousands of users. Uh, those tens of thousands of users might have hundreds of thousands of devices. Those hundreds of thousands of devices might have hundreds of applications that they log into with. And those hundreds of applications might have millions and millions of files. And so what you start seeing is there's this kind of web of interaction which gets pretty complex. And there's billions and billions of nodes that you're starting to have to go out and manage. And what this does is this increases the complexity quite exponentially. And as this complexity increases, you start to see that the risk uh, for the surface area for data leakage of sensitive content continues to get bigger and bigger. And so what you're starting to see as a result of this is the number of breached records that you see year over year within the industry keeps increasing. The amount of breaches, the amount of sensitive content, data leakage that's happening as a result of that it's, you know, continues to keep increasing. And so let's just look at some data over here. So if you, um, there are some studies that are done where the average cost of a breach worldwide is about $3.9 billion. I'm sorry, $3.9 million per breach. 
and the $3.9 million includes about 25,000 records where you define a record as something that has personally identifiable information. Now, let's just take a look at this and dig a little bit deeper. Um, why are all these breaches happening? If you look at the 1.4 billion PII records that were just leaked in 2018, there were two main reasons why these breaches occurred. Right? The first one was about 55% of that was because of negligent use. There was a negligent user that made a mistake as a result of which there was a breach that occurred. Now, I can assure you, no one goes into work saying, today I'm gonna be negligent, right? And so the reason that negligence happens, we, each one of us have probably faced some, some kind of flavor of this in our professional careers, where you might have undisclosed, um, kind of, you know, uh, un unintended disclosures of information where you accidentally sent a document to someone that you, you weren't supposed to send, or you might have a lost device, or you might have a lost document. And so that actually comprises about 55% of the reason that breaches happen. And then the second, the, the, the remainder of the 45% typically happens because of malicious behavior. And this malicious behavior tip is, you know, consists of things like malware and hacks. You might have fraud that might happen. There might be malicious insiders. Someone got fired. They were disgruntled as an employee. They wanted to actually download some data and take it to the next employer and share your intellectual property with someone else. Those things happen all the time. And so you're starting to see that you know, there's a fair amount of concentration of the breaches in, with these two issues, negligent use and malicious users. Now, the good news is that we understand the source of these challenges. The bad news is that today's security solutions can't really solve these problems. And the reason they can't solve these problems is there's, the, today's architectures are typically built on a bolt-on uh, kind of mechanism. So there's a bolt-on architecture that's built. So if I think about, let me give you an example. If you were to buy a car, but you had to go to someone else to buy your alarm system for the car, it would just be very unnatural because you want to make sure that your alarm system is fully integrated into the car. It's a very similar thing that's actually absent within the content arena where you might actually have um, you know, a, um, um, a content platform, but the way that this has actually worked in the past is you've got these bolt-on security providers that would come in, and as a result, the experience that you might provide to your user when you need to share content from your system to an external user it tends to be intercepted with a bolt-on security provider. So while the job gets done and the leak might be prevented, there's a big limitation in the sense that the experience is completely broken. And so what this does is it lacks critical business context. There's no critical business context that's available to tell me, the recipient, why didn't I receive this document because there was some PII in that document and as a result it got intercepted. Um, there's no uh, information for me, the sender, on why did this person I sent this document to didn't receive that document. So the first one is there's lack of business process um, context that's, th that's there. The second one is what this does is it tends to break collaboration and workflows. Precisely at the time when we all need to make sure that we are innovating on our business model and facing disruption, that's when those workflows are breaking that you actually need to have for fluidly collaborating with people both inside and outside the organization. And lastly, there's this gap in data leakage prevention as a result of this. So your security story continues to keep getting worse. Your security problem keeps getting worse. And so what we wanted to do was make sure that we thought about this very, very deeply and said, what if you could provide a world where there was precision-based security controls? So, um, you know, I want to make sure that the controls I'm putting are not blanketly applied on all the content. It's actually applied only on a few pieces of content that might be the most important content. If this is a top secret document, don't allow it to be shared outside. Everything else, it's okay if it's shared with an external user. That top secret document, also don't allow it to be downloaded. Um, the second thing would be really interesting to have in this design goal was, could you put guardrails for internal and external users that are intelligent so that you can prevent people from making mistakes before they happen because the security system is in context and actually warns you before you're gonna do something that might be construed as negligent. And lastly, make sure that that's all provided in line into your experience so that the data leakage prevention can happen in line. So these were the things that were the big reasons why we thought that we needed to make sure that we really rethought security from the ground up in the cloud world. And for this precise reason, we built Box Shield. We briefly talked about it a little bit last year, but we've actually essentially wanted to go out and build the capability in a product that was advanced security, that was intelligent, frictionless security that didn't really create a huge amount of hurdles for the user for the way that they work today. And to talk a, li a little bit more about that, I'm gonna invite Alok on stage.
Folks, I'm Alok, and I run security products at Box, and I'm super happy to talk to you about our latest security offering called Shield. As Jitu talked to you about this, bolt-on security architectures are not designed for real-time prevention of data leakage in the cloud. Not only that, these bolt-on solutions end up creating a lot of friction that comes in the way of getting work done. As a result, users, employees, they tend to work around the system, which are even more, which are even less secure, which is really bad for business and even worse for security and compliance. At Box, we would like to change that. To deliver inline data leakage prevention and frictionless user experience, we believe content security needs to be woven into the way people work today. To do that, we are reimagining content security in the cloud. First, we are leveraging machine learning and contextual understanding of your enterprise to deliver anomaly detection as well as adaptive content controls. Second, we are bringing these very security controls right around the content. It cannot get closer than that. Based on this security architecture, we can deliver inline data leakage prevention while ensuring frictionless user experience. Let me give an example. If an employee is trying to invite an external user to a highly confidential folder, Shield will understand that and prevent that from happening natively in Box. Now, built on this modern security architecture, Shield helps you solve for two major problems. With smart access, it helps you prevent accidental leakage of data by using classification-driven security controls. And with threat detection, it helps you identify suspicious user behaviors that could be an indicator of a potential data leak in your enterprise. So let's talk about smart access. With smart access, you get the ability to define your own custom classification labels, confidential, internal, public, whatever makes sense for your IT. And then you can classify content natively in Box. And once you have classified your content, you can apply these security controls that prevent accidental uh, leakage of sensitive data. Let me walk you through this. So let's say you have a piece of content that's uploaded to Box. You can use one of these four methods of classifying content natively in Box with Shield. And you also have the option to classify the content using our partner-built integrations for content classification. Now, let's say if the content is classified, you could use one or more of these six security controls and apply them automatically. Let's say you classify the content as internal. You might want to restrict the shared links to company and collaborators only. Or, or in addition, you might want to also limit external collaboration to partners with approved domains. Now, in contrast, if you classify your content as confidential, you might want to apply additional security controls, such as download restriction across internal and external users, as well as limiting content access to third-party applications that meet your security and compliance requirements, such as GXP, PCI, HIPAA, and so on. What's interesting about these security controls is that they're designed to be very surgical in nature. What does that mean? What it means to you is that you can now protect content that truly needs protection instead of applying enterprise-wide security restrictions. But we are not stopping there. In addition to these six, six, uh, six, six security controls, we plan to build a lot more security controls as we go, including built-in workflow for policy exception handling, as well as auto-expiry of content, of share links based on content classification, and so on. We have a very robust roadmap, and we are just getting started. Now let's talk about threat detection. With threat detection, Shield can help you identify, identify suspicious download patterns that could be an indicator of a user trying to steal or leak sensitive data. It can also help you identify if sensitive piece of content is being accessed from an unusual location, such as a high-risk country or a location where you don't have a business presence. And lastly, it can help you identify cases where a compromised account is being used to access sensitive content because we can help you detect suspicious sessions natively in Box. Now you might say, hey, look, you know what? This sounds very interesting, but what's different about your approach here? 
what's different about Shield and how you're doing and how, how we're solving these problems. So let me walk you through that. So the way we have built the machine learning engine has been built from ground up to understand how people work natively and how they collaborate. For example, we can understand the interaction trends on content in your enterprise. Let's say you have one, maybe two users that are uploading content actively to a folder, but hundreds, maybe thousands of employees are downloading content. Guess what? That folder is likely not sensitive. Now compare that to say, you know, a research folder where research scientists are working on that next drug design, and they are actively editing, editing content as they're doing new discoveries, but they are rarely downloading content from the browser. That difference in interaction trend is very, very important, and Shield natively understands that. Let me give another example. Shield can draw a contrast between users' activity vis-a-vis -vis their baseline, as well as the cohort that they're working with. So what does that mean? So let's say if a user from sales cluster goes and downloads a lot of content from the engineering cluster, which is not expected or usual, Shield can understand that as a suspicious pattern and it can flag that for security to take a look at it. And lastly, Shield deeply understands how people work across devices and applications. So Shield can understand the difference between a user copying or moving content outside a box drive to a local folder on the desktop. It could be a USB drive, for all that matters. And then also understand the difference between a user moving content within box drive itself. In addition, it can also understand which applications really share the IP address of the client or the user instead of the IP of the application in a given data center. These nuances matter a lot, and this is exactly where a bolt-on security architecture or solution fails. Right? Let me bring it all together for you. So Shield helps you solve two major problems. With smart access, it helps you prevent accidental leakage of data, and with threat detection, it helps you identify suspicious user behavior that could be an indicator of potential leak in your enterprise. Now, to give you a demo of the product, I would like to invite Erica and Rachel to stage. Before we get in the demo, I want to set the plot for you. As you all know, each industry deals with a lot of sensitive data. Call it intellectual property, trade secrets, personally identifiable information, on and on and on. For the demo today, we're going to use life sciences industry as an example and show how Shield can help IT and end users both to protect their sensitive content. We'll call this company Rex Biopharma. And for those, for those of you who do not know, drug discovery and development process is a very complex undertaking. It's a multi-stage process which is highly regulated. It involves a lot of intellectual property as well as PII data, such as patient clinical trial data. Now, like in the case of any new product development, it starts with a lot of internal collaboration between research scientists where they're discovering new compounds, new drugs. But as the drug is ready for clinical trial, it requires extensive internal and external collaboration across clinical research organizations, auditors, volunteers, and research scientists. Now, it's important and critical that the clinical trial process is secured and no, late, and no data leakage happens. It's paramount to the success of Rex Biopharma. With that, let me introduce the roles of these two fabulous ladies on stage. So Erica is part of the IT team at Rex Biopharma, and Rachel is playing program manager who is responsible for the clinical trial process. And well, I will continue to play my role, which is a product manager for Shield. All right, so Erica, you know very well that you know Rex Bio is dealing, you know, in a very regular is working in a regulated environment. You have to solve for complex regulatory needs and meet security requirements. So can you tell me how Shield will help prevent accidental leakage of data while ensuring user productivity? Yes. I can show you how easy it is to classify content in Box using Box Shield with classification labels and access policies. So these are my labels, and basically they're guardrails around sensitive data. And that means that only approved external users can access my content, and they're coordinated with an access policy. So I'm going to use this partner-only access policy. You can see it's actually mapped to the partner-only label, and I'm going to add my security controls. So let's make sure that shared links can only be shared with Rex Bio 
and approved external collaborators, and make sure the shared link expires after five days. Now this is important because this only affects this data and not the rest of the enterprise. And make sure that users can only access from an approved list, so only partners that have signed an NDA with RexBio. This is gonna come in handy when Rachel demos too. So when I make sure that also those users can't download to their uh, personal devices, I'm restricting their, restricting their download activity and I can also confirm that only GXP compliant applications can access this as an integration. I hit save, and I just saved my clinical trial. Well, that's really interesting. You know, you could define policy with ease, but I'm curious, you know, I'm sure in your enterprise, some user may have generated a public link for a very sensitive content much before you enforce this policy. So how can Shield help there? Yes, so this is gonna be effective on all users going forward and retroactively, which is good news for our existing customers. So as you can see here, Box has done all the deep thinking about how users access and manage data. Security gives me their requirements, and I implement them. It's pretty easy, Alok. Great. So as you just saw, defining classification labels and defining a corresponding class access policy in Shield is super easy. Now let's shift gear, and I'm curious what the end user experience looks like. So Rachel, as a program manager, can you walk us through what she looks like as you interact. Yeah, absolutely. So let me show you what it looks like for an end user. As a program manager, I run all of the clinical trials at RexBio, but that also means that any of the sensitive data that might fall under security re requirements, I might also be responsible for. So I really need proactive guardrails to be able to minimize data leakage as well as any compliant risks. Thanks to Box, it's really simple for me to be able to see all of the three classifications that were defined by my IT team. So in this case, I know that I need to use partner-only classification, and I can see exactly what's going to be enforced based off its, this classification. And in that single click, that classification is cascaded to all of my files and folders automatically. And Shield makes it really easy for me to be able to see exactly what's going to be enforced here on the right-hand side in really easy to understand language so I don't just think something's broken. Now, that is the most rich information that I'll be able to see transparently, transparently as an end user. Not only that, let's say that I also have a file that I need to upload into this clinical trial folder, such as this trial project plan. And upon upload, that classification is automatically enforced along with that enforced policy. Now, in a perfect world, you'd think that'd be enough, but we all know that's not the world we live in. In my trial phase one folder, I also have a document, the FDA guidelines that needs to be public. So I can go ahead and manually override that classification to public and make it really easy for my external users to be able to see that document. I don't have to involve IT to be able to change that classification. And I can actually go back to my day job of working with an external party, the CRO Corp, an outsourced clinical research organization that I've been working with for the past couple months. Oh wait, it looks like I only have two options here. I can only share with people in my company or invited users in this folder. Erica, is this you? Yep, that's my policy. Wow, so Shield is actually making sure that both myself and the team don't actually generate any public shared links. Instead, I'm gonna invite John and Alicia, the two users that I've been working with at the CRO Corp, into this trial phase one folder as external users. And in that single, oh, shh, it looks like Shield actually blocked me from inviting Alicia because I used her Gmail address. Meanwhile, John was automatically invited into this folder because I used his correct corporate email. Wow, Shield just saved me from potentially leaking thousands upon thousands of records and honestly probably saved me my job. Alok, I feel like Shield really had my back there. Absolutely, <laughs> like as Jitu said, no, no user comes to office trying to be negligent and shit happens. So Shield is designed to make sure that accident and leakage of data does not happen. Now, Rachel, you shared this with John, right? So can you walk us through John's experience? Yeah, let's look at what John sees from his perspective as an external user. He's a clinical coordinator at that same external partner, the clinical research organization. He's invited into the same folder, he's already accepted it, and he's ready to work on these documents. So he likes to travel on the road a lot. And he's also a little bit old school, so he likes to download absolutely everything in this folder before he gets on the road. We all know those types of users. 
But thanks to Shield, it locks all of the download from that sensitive content that you just saw me classify, except for that single document, that FDA guidelines, which he can also work with. But he can still seamlessly interact with all of that sensitive content, such as this patient data file, which he can view in the browser. You can also see that same classification by my IT team explaining to him why he couldn't download that particular file or even edit it locally. So instead, he can choose between whichever editing application he likes, Excel or Google, and in this case he chose Microsoft, to each their own, I guess. And then he makes that change, and it's saved automatically back into Box, just like he's used to. And he can see that second version here. So thanks to Shield, he's able to seamlessly work on the road, continue collaborating with me in this particular folder without worrying about any of RexBio's security policies or enforced classifications. I feel like that means that, Erica, you can finally take that well-deserved vacation. And maybe I will finally put in less IT tickets. <laughs> Alok, what do you think? So what's interesting here is that John, the external user, for him, even though Rex Bio does not own John's identity, nor the device where he's coming from, Shield's access policy could have been, was enforced seamlessly. He could not download the content, but he could edit it online using Excel, online, or Google Apps. So that's really interesting. So in a nutshell, smart access allowed IT to define classification labels and the corresponding policies easily, and it then provided guardrail around how users work. Like when Rachel made a mistake, it helped prevent the breach from happening. Now, we talked about negligent users and possible user errors and so on. So, Erica, we always have that like 1%, maybe 0.5% of users that might be malicious and <laughs> might abuse the access they have. So how can Shield help there? Yeah, I can help with that. I can start by creating a threat detection rule. And what that does is it will notify me of any unusual activity in Box. So that could be anything from someone downloading a lot of content before quitting their job or accessing Box from a risky country or just a place where Rex Bio doesn't have any business presence. So let's use anomalous download. Not all downloads are bad, Box knows that, yep. but I do want to be uh, notified when something like that happens. So I'm gonna make sure that my security team gets a notification from Box Shield, as well as our event management tool, Splunk. I save that. Just like that, that was pretty easy. Now I'll know if something sketchy is happening in Box. Yep, so this is exactly where machine learning comes to rescue. So instead of defining complex correlation rules, you can use ML-based templates in Shield to define a rule, and off it will go to identify suspicious user behaviors. Yeah. Have you seen any alerts yet? Not yet. Oh, I just got a notification right. from Box Shield. So this is an overview of an incident. It looks like Jeanette, who's the perpetrator, there might have been some unusual download activity on that account. I'm gonna expand that. And this is a high volume of downloads for our chief scientist, Jeanette. Jeanette, she's always been on the straight and narrow. Honestly, you would think it was me, Erica. I know. Let's not jump to any conclusions. I'm gonna unpack this and look at some more information. It's coming from the web app and it's being downloaded to a personal device. I can also drill in here and actually see where the content was downloaded from by folder. So if I look at this, this is content that's been downloaded from that clinical trials folder and some of it was classified. This is visibility that I've never had before. This is super useful. I, um... I wonder how would you have done this before without Shield? It's hard to imagine, right? Shield simplifies it and puts it in, into an interface that's really easy to understand. So I'm gonna take a look at more of the session details just to see why she would do this. I actually have a hunch, Alok. Okay, so this is indicating that there's a suspicious session from an IP address that we've never seen before. Jeanette works in New York, but this session came from the Ukraine. Ukraine? Does anyone have a red telephone back there, or is that just an action movies? We might not need that type of action. I do have more information about why this is fishy. The user agent strings don't match, and I can tell that most of her activity does take place in New York, so that's why this session is anomalous. My guess is that her token or her session was compromised, that this actually isn't Jeanette. Here's the information that I need to then escalate to my security team. This is why it's so critical. I have all of the insights and context into this activity, and then if I want to zoom out, now I have all the information on my users and their notable activity in Box. Box Shield gives me the information I need when I need it. That's great. So you just saw Shield threat detection in action. So Erica and Rachel, 
Thank you for the fabulous, uh, fabulous demo. All right, so let me sum it up for you. So Shield helps you solve for two major problems. With smart access, it helps you prevent accidental leakage of data. And with threat detection, it helps you identify suspicious user behavior that could be, an, could be an indicator of potential data leakage. Not only that, Shield is designed to work in your IT ecosystem. So if you have a log management tool, Shield alerts can be forwarded to a log management solution or a CASB. And we'll talk a little bit about Splunk in a second, so I'm gonna skip through that. To sum it up and close, I would like to thank all our customers who have helped us, provided feedback to build this product, and, help, and their feedback has gone into building the product. So on behalf of the, uh, the product and the engineering team, I would like to thank all of our customers who have been part of this journey with us. With that, I would like to introduce G2 back to stage. And it is generally available later this month. That's the best part. So um, make sure that you buy some. <laughs> All right. So with that, what we wanted to do was, you know, we talked about two very specific use cases around smart access and uh, threat detection. But this industry is all about making sure that we're working tightly with the partner ecosystem. And uh, one of the key leaders in the space is uh, Splunk. And we want to make sure that we actually have a very tight integration between Shield and Splunk. And so uh, to talk a little bit more about that, and also um, a, a great guy that I've, I've gotten to know and really enjoyed gotten to know is uh, Tim Tully, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Splunk. Um, so can we invite Tim on stage? Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about what's happening in the security industry in general. Like, what's, what's going on here? What, what are you seeing as being the big major trends and shifts? Yeah, there's a couple things. One is um, what we're seeing at Splunk is there's definitely a, a proliferation of, of security solutions. Yeah. It's starting to feel to me sort of like a rainbow of solutions, and customers are starting to feel really overwhelmed by the by the variety. And um, at Splunk, we're, we're trying to solve that by trying to coalesce a lot of these solutions together into a, a single pane of glass. So that's really important to us, and I'm sure many of you in the crowd feel the effects of that as well. Um, the other thing is just the, the way that people deploy applications is evolving pretty quickly. Yeah. So you're seeing people move to the cloud uh, very quickly. They're trying to containerize things. Everyone's running things on Kubernetes with microservices. Right. And so what you care about from a security perspective is evolving really, really quickly. You know, there's a lot of security startups that are looking at monitoring containers and preventing lateral movement across orchestration clusters. So those are really hard challenges that are, that are evolving quickly. Um, I now uh, lead the IT and security team at Splunk in addition to product and engineering and so I care a lot about what we do from an IT perspective, and one of the things that worries me a lot is the, the bring your own device culture. Um, I definitely want to bring all my devices, but what that does is it opens up the attack surface area. Sure. Uh, having more devices on, on the corporate network means there's more to monitor, so. Yeah, and, and as you think about this, how does AI and machine learning play into the, uh, the picture with what you folks are doing? <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're heavily, heavily focused on machine, machine learning. I think Splunk has some of the best machine learning leaders in the industry today. Um, but one of the things uh, that I'm really passionate about is having machine learning not be in your face. And oftentimes, I'll, I'll, when I talk to the engineering team, I'll reference Netflix. Like, Netflix does a, a ton of machine learning, but it's not in your face. It's just yeah. automatically part of the product experience. Yeah. And so the users of the products don't think about how the models are trained or how they're built or how they're evolved. It's just built in natively to the product in a very applied way. Yeah. Um, and so that's how we approach machine learning. And it's great to see the demo of, of Box Shield and to see that you guys think the same yeah, way. Yeah, we actually think exactly the same way. And it's, uh, you know, one of the things that's happened is there's a lot of overhype on the actual technology rather than the problem that you can solve with the technology. So. Yeah, definitely. And uh, that's why we're trying to apply more, more of an applied model to machine learning rather than just talking about it and having it be in your face. And now, uh, if you can just, let me just deviate a little bit, like going, going into this whole consumerization of IT, what got you really passionate? Because I know I was at the uh, Barack Obama event that you folks did last week, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and, um, but what, what got you really excited about consumerization, the user experience, and the elegance with which you can go out and deliver experiences for users so that they can consume security services just as elegantly as they can some of the other services. Yeah, I think you don't typically see this in the security industry. Yeah, definitely not. And um, I, I think a lot of it just has to do with my, my, my background. Uh, I spent a long time at Yahoo, almost 14 years. And that was a, a consumer company, but I was always working on Hadoop or open source big data things. Yeah. And seeing sort of that, that need to satisfy users from a consumer perspective drives a lot of what we do at Splunk. So usability matters a lot. Customer em empathy matters a lot to me. Um, and the other thing is I'm a user of all these products. I use them ferociously. 
Uh, and I still code a lot, so I care a lot about sort of the usability of the products. And uh, I don't see why it should be any different for the enterprise user. Totally agreed. Um, so as you think about our two companies and how we're thinking of integrating together, you want to say a few words on what got you excited about the partnership and why, why there's a logical tie between the two of us? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely an uh, unsolicited uh, plug for you guys, but uh, I, I mentioned taking over the We, we take them uh, readily <laughs> anytime. Um, when I first started looking at uh, solutions within the company, I had a lot of people in, in the team say, hey, I want more box. And then the next day, coincidentally, there was a reach out to have me come up and, and talk about it. So um, it's, on one hand, it's great to see that there's a lot of demand for it within my teams. Um, but the other thing is just, I'm really excited about the partnership. I'm really excited about the approach that you guys have to security. Um, I watched a lot of the demo backstage just now, and, and I think the way that you guys are approaching security for content in the cloud is, is amazing. Um, obviously, the fact that we have a partnership and there's an application that you guys are building that sits on top of our platform is, is a no-brainer, um, and yeah. we really appreciate it. Uh, we're, we're really excited about making sure that this is not a siloed kind of thing that we're doing, that we're actually tying into the ecosystem, and you're such a big part of the ecosystem. So uh, super excited. I think um, as there was a press release that came out this morning, we're going to be working very tightly on a partnership and announcing an expanded partnership between our two organizations. There's already a partnership between us, but we're going to take it to the next level, and our product and engineering teams are going to be geeking out together and making sure that we have the best experience going from one, one, one product to the other as you take Shield events and put it into Splunk so you can actually have greater visibility of it. So thank you for that. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. I appreciate that. Yep, and um, uh, the, the last question I'd have for you is, uh, what would you tell, uh, any advice for the audience as they're thinking about the world of security and as they're thinking about what they should be keeping in mind as they're going into uh, the future? Yeah, I would just definitely go back to um, you know, the, one of the first questions, which is there's a lot of security solutions out there today. Um, life is getting a lot harder and a lot more complex to manage. We talked about mobile devices being part of the network. We talked about the movement to the cloud and what happens when you move your entire application stack to, to Kubernetes. So I, I think people should really think about how you're going to protect the network yeah. and how you're going to protect the content, especially the content that sits in, inside the box. So uh, the, the security landscape is definitely evolving with everyone's advent and, and move to the cloud. So. Tim, thank you for joining us on stage, man. Thank you very much. Really excited about the partnership. That's frictionless security and compliance, uh, folks. And then if you think about frictionless security and compliance, when it's delivered in the right way, it actually helps you get work done in a much better, kind of much more fluid manner. And so this whole notion of seamless internal and external collaboration and workflow is something that we've, fed, we, we've spent a, um, you know, kind of a fair amount of time on. And as you folks know, Box has pioneered the secure collaboration across the extended enterprise. That's one of our core hallmarks that um, why, why customers have purchased us. So what I wanted to do is just walk you through some of the innovation that we've done over the course of the past year itself. Uh, and a lot of, um, you know, kind of continued improvement in the experience that you see with Box. So, for example, you know, a very, very simple and secure sharing experience where just literally within two taps or two clicks, you can go out and share a file or a folder with someone outside the organization. These are things that are optimizations that you've learned to kind of um, enjoy with us, but we continue to keep optimizing them. And so um, what you've seen is over here a completely transformed experience that we, we delivered with uh, this one capability so you could remove the friction from the sharing flow. And what you've also seen uh, over the course of the past year that we, um, we introduced in the product was this easy to use view of who is this folder or file shared with internally but also externally. So you can actually take a look at who the people are that you've shared this fo file or folder with and which ones are within your organization versus which ones are outside your organization. How does that work? And then the third key area that we, um, we did a lot of kind of innovation on is this whole notion of box notes. So this is when people want to collaborate with each other, they want to make sure that they actually, there's, there's a real-time aspect to collaboration for both people that are inside and outside the organization. And so we've done a lot of enhancements in box notes, like um, ma making sure that you have presence detection, so you know exactly who is working on that document at a given point in time as you're starting to work on that document. One of the key use cases that we wanted to really optimize box notes for was meetings. And the second key use case was projects. How do you make sure that those actually get better and better? Uh, and what we've also done is this new capability that we added, which was embedding your preview right within a box note. So what we started seeing was people were using box notes and they wanted to make sure that there were multiple file links in there. You can now actually choose to view the file and the preview right within the box note itself. So you'll, uh, you'll actually get to see a lot of kind of, you know, um, exciting experiences over there that get created. So uh, as you can see, there's going to be continuous innovation we're going to make on the collaboration side um, as we move forward because that's the way that people want to just work in a more fluid manner. But content is also the heart of most common and important business processes. 
So the workflows that you might have in your organization uh, that are content centric tend to comprise a lion's share of the kind of workflows you might have, um, you know, uh, that are being operationalized within your, your, your company. And this is happening across, once again, every function, every industry, every geography. So if you look at something like sales, where you might have a sales enablement workflow, where you want to go out and make sure that you can train, you know, hundreds of thousands of sales reps uh, with the right kind of content and have it standardized, that's a great workflow to make sure that um, um, you, you optimize with, um, um, you know, with content. There's um, digital kind of design agency collaboration that you might have in marketing. In R&D, you might have a project kickoff or SOP management. In HR, you might have an employee onboarding use case. These are all kind of different use cases that you start to see a huge amount of um, uh, streamlining possibility in as you move forward. Now, the challenge is today's systems tend to be overly complex in the way in which they automate these workflows. So what you start to find is these legacy systems have actually got a pretty poor experience. And, the, and in order to automate them, you, would, you actually have to burden the IT department to ensure that they're creating these workflows. And they tend to be only limited to the scope of internal employees only for the most part. So what you start to see is this tremendously inefficient mechanism on how people get work done and how people automate processes that simply is not quite the way that it needs to be. Um, and so we thought long and hard about this problem. Um, and we, um, we had made a few acquisitions and we had, you know, um, um, last year and we wanted to make sure that that team combined with our team really thought deeply about what this problem was. And we said, what if you could have a really lightweight solution and the lightweight solution was self-serve so you didn't always have to make sure that you burdened IT for going out and creating a workflow because workflows need to be created by process owners within organizations. And then lastly, don't constrain those artificially to just the employees of your organization because the reality is that sometimes you might work with people far more deeply that are outside your organization for certain processes than you might within your organization. So it has to span the, the boundary in a pretty fluid manner. And so we said, how should we go about building this? And we have to keep it lightweight, we have to keep it simple, uh, and has to be unmistakably boxed, but it yet has to be powerful. And so we thought about a model which was, you know, if you did something which was an if this, then that kind of model, which said, you know, if I uploaded a file into this folder, then make sure that you can assign a task as a system automatically to someone that needs to go review and approve that file. Um, and so, that, you know, those kind of things. If the file that has been reviewed and approved um, is, um, is, is now uh, uh, needing to have kind of metadata kind of, up to, uh, you know, uh, uploaded, what do you need to do to make sure that the metadata gets uploaded uh, in an effective way and make sure that that happens in an automatic manner? So we wanted to keep it really simple, really lightweight, ex expanding to the extended enterprise. And we said, what do we need to do to make sure that we build a world-class experience that is Im completely embedded into Box and takes advantage of all the security, compliance, scalability, data protection, privacy kind of um, um, assumptions that Box has made in its core content platform and extend it to the workflows that we have and make sure that you can engage people outside the organization. And for this reason, precisely, we built Box Relay. And to talk a little bit more about that, let me introduce to you Varun. I'm Varun, VP of Products at Box, and I'm super excited today to talk to you about Relay. As Jitu mentioned, companies of all sizes and across all verticals are using Relay today to automate their critical business processes. And when you look at all of these different processes, they broadly speaking fall into two usage patterns. The first one is around content review and approval, where essentially what you're trying to do is automate the assignment of tasks. As it turns out, the vast majority, literally 90% of approvals on content today happen over email. And what Relay allows you to do is automate, standardize, and streamline this entire process. An example of this process would be digital asset approval, where you have your marketing as well as design team that's working with an external contractor, and you can completely standardize and automate that entire process using Relay. The second usage pattern is around onboarding and offboarding for projects, employees, customers, vendors, suppliers. So in this scenario, typically what you're trying to do is create a folder structure, make copies of template files and put them in these folders, and then add collaborators, both internal and external, based on the business need. And Relay can essentially automate this entire end-to-end -end process without you engaging with developers to write scripts or having someone in your team manually perform all of these tasks. 
An example of this process would be a new customer onboarding, where you want to share some content with them, and you want to standardize that entire process. Relay can take care of that. And by automating all of these critical business processes, Relay delivers on three key business outcomes. The first one is by reducing risk, as well as you know, non-standardized approvals, Relay will essentially make sure that the process gets completely standardized. The second one is by having an end-to-end -end audit trail across every single step and every single execution of the workflow, you will be able to improve compliance. And finally, by ensuring that the handoffs across the steps are automated, along with very robust due date reminders, you'll be able to accelerate cycle times for your business processes. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with Relay, uh, I'm gonna walk you through the key capabilities uh, of the product. So one of the things that customers tell us that they really, really love about Relay is the fact that it enables self-service for the business user through a no-code intuitive workflow builder. What this ensures is that the IT team is not burdened with constant asks from the business to automate their critical business processes, but does it while making sure that IT has full control over which employee in the organization can go ahead and build this workflow. And just like the rest of Box, adding external collaborators is dead simple in Relay. Now let me talk to you uh, about some of the powerful capabilities that we offer in Relay. The first one is the ability to automate both parallel as well as sequential workflows. An example of a sequential workflow would be that you wanna trigger a VP approval only after both the manager as well as the director have approved a project. Relay also supports conditional routing using metadata. So example out here would be based on the contract value, you can trigger an approval for CFO. For example, the CFO approval is only required for contracts over half a million dollars. As well as rejection routing, where essentially you want to build a workflow, and if the approval task is rejected, you wanna route that workflow back to a previous step. An example of that would be, let's say I'm the finance director, and I, uh, I have been asked for a budget approval and I decline it, the requester of that workflow gets a notification with instructions of what do they need to uh, update before that workflow will automatically get uh, triggered. As well as the ability for you to trigger workflows both automatically as well as manually. And what manual triggers allows is gives the choice to the business user where they get to decide when do they need to run the review process with their internal team once the draft proposal is ready. Now, one of my personal favorites is that Box enables mobile ways of working. For those of you who might be new to Box, we recently launched the Task Center, which is the one place in Box for all of your to-dos. And now, uh, business users, executives, as well as road warriors can one-click approve all of these tasks on their mobile device. This, combined with the ability to preview files on mobile, as well as add comments as part of the review and approval workflow, makes work uh, uh, while on the go really, really easy. I love it. Now, when we built Relay, one of the things that we did was we wanted to make sure that both the process owner as well as the IT administrator has full visibility and control over all the workflows getting created inside of the enterprise. So through our dashboards and advanced reporting capabilities, you can see who did what when, as well as have a real-time view into every single running instance of a workflow. And because Relay is a native capability of Box, any workflow built in Relay inherits the Box's industry-leading security and compliance capabilities. Relay also leverages the P-built uh, integrations in Box, including those uh, around workflow, electronic signatures, as well as integration hub. And recently, we announced a partnership with Oracle where Box now integrates with Oracle and other third-party applications using the Oracle integration product. Now let me walk you through a couple of examples, real world examples of customers today around how they're using Relay to automate their critical business processes. So the first one is Broadcom, which is a global supplier of semiconductor and infrastructure software, and they're using Relay to streamline their procurement review process. This process requires a multiple stakeholders across finance, legal, lines of business and procurement to come together to run a, con a vendor contract approval process. Once the vendor contract is submitted, it runs through a bunch of approvals. 
And at the end of it, this uh, contract is saved to a folder inside a box. The other example is IDEX, which is a public company uh, in the business of development uh, and distribution of animal medical diagnostic products. And they are running their lab equipment proce uh, process through Relay, uh, where any change to a lab equipment needs to be routed through a predetermined process that involves uh, department managers, quality managers, program managers, and so on and so forth. And once this uh, approval is, uh, is, uh, is, is, as goes through, this uh, change request form gets saved inside of a folder that uh, then gets archived. And these are just two of the hundreds and hundreds of examples of customers today who are using Relay to automate their critical business processes. Now, for those of you who have not been listening to me and actually looking at the cute picture of this puppy, <laughs> I'm sorry I'll have to break it up for you by inviting Jitu back on stage, so thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so that was Frictionless security and compliance and seamless internal and external collaboration and workflow. We won't walk through that. Now, all of these things shouldn't work by themselves, and we need to make sure that they actually fit into your entire ecosystem of investments that, we, that you've made. So let's talk about the third area real quickly. So if you think about your IT stack today, it looks very, very different from what it did 10 years ago. In fact, there's many, many clouds that you've gone out and purchased to go conduct very, very specific um, processes within your business. You might have uh, you know, ServiceNow for your ITSM, and you might have Salesforce for your CRM, and you might have Office 365 for your productivity apps, and you're going to have AutoCAD for your engineering apps, and so on and so forth. And you've got you know, tens, if not hundreds, of clouds that you might have within your organization. Now, the challenge that happens in this, and the, 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 the first thing over here is, if you think about the client-server era to this era, the big difference is in the client-server era, you went out and purchased everything from a single vendor, and today you've actually got choice, so you, you, you purchase it from multiple vendors. The challenge, though, is when you think about content, that content fits into each one of these clouds separately, and there's an individual silo of content in each one of these clouds. And that actually get, you know, tends to be a problem. So wouldn't you want to have something which was a standardized system or record that all that content went into, but then allowed you to make sure that regardless of the application that you're working in, you should be able to access the content that's actually in Box. And that was the design goal of how we thought about this back in 2008 when we opened up our APIs. And we wanted to make sure that we continued that kind of uh, journey around ensuring that we became the standard system of record uh, and also provided systems of engagement capabilities but that tied into each one of those clouds. Now, we are continuing that journey to continue to enhance um, those capabilities. And we, uh, over the course of the past year, have gone out and made a ton of enhancements in our integration efforts. So we now have a very seamless integration into G Suite. We've enhanced our integration into Outlook. We've just announced an integration with Oracle. We, earlier uh, in the year, announced an integration with ServiceNow uh, that's available in the market. We just announced an integration with Zendesk Cell, where you actually have their CRM system tied into Box. We now have the ability to preview an AutoCAD document right within box as well. So there's a ton of these innovations that are going on. And specifically, what you're starting to see is these have now happened with about 1,400 or so applications in the market that you might use within your organization that are integrated in a box. So um, this is a massive um, you know, journey that's been, uh, that, that began in 2008. And we've continued to keep making sure that we have an open system, open API, open mindset that ties into these systems. And I'm delighted to announce another expanded partnership today with Adobe, where we're going to tie in, based on a lot of customer demand, a very, very deep integration in Adobe. So back in, 2000, in 2016, we tied in with them, and you folks enjoy our desktop integration with the Adobe products, where you might have Box that can tie into the desktop applications. We're going to extend that same capability also onto the web applications that Adobe has. So you'll see many, many more announcements that come out over time, but we have expanded that partnership. Um, and um, you know, stay tuned for more. Now, as you think about these 1,400 applications, we want to make sure that not only have we gone out and built the application, but we've actually continued to keep enhancing the experience that people have across those applications. So it seems like a fluid process uh, as content moves through those applications. And the first one of those that I want to talk to you about is Slack, where it's, uh, you know, we've had a very um, a strong integration with Slack for a while. A lot of you folks use it and love it, and we wanted to make sure that we made it better. 
And so what we've done with Slack is ensured that we can make sure that we have a few really meaningful enhancements based on feedback that we got from the users. So the first one was the ability for us to be able to have um, a link in a file that automatically shows you a thumbnail as a card right within the Slack interface so that you know not just what the link is but what that file um, actually is and it'll show you the thumbnail of that. Now the second thing which you do in Slack, it's, which is really interesting, is um, when you post a file from Box into a Slack channel, not always does everyone in the Slack channel have permissions to that file. And so what we've done is we've actually used AI to make sure that we can actually work with Slack and created a bot that says, hey, there's a um, channel which has all of these users and not all those users in fact have permission on this file. Would you like to inline in Slack provide permission for that file? And if so, do you want to provide permission as a viewer, as an editor, so on and so forth. So we've actually now provided that capability in the next integration of Slack, which will be really good for the people that use, use Slack a lot. Um, and then what we've done is made sure that from a security and compliance perspective, our goal is to make sure that every application you use continues to get more and more secure and more and more compliant when you use your content and put it in box. So one of the capabilities we have in Slack now is the ability to disable a thumbnail and the view of the thumbnail as an admin capability if not everyone in that channel has access to that file so that you don't go out and s share sensitive information in that file. And that is an administrative control that we'll have on the box side that can be enabled as well. And you'll also be able to do things like automatic unfurling so that you don't you know, uh, reveal the file name, so on and so forth. So that those are the kind of things that we'll continue to keep enhancing. But uh, this is a really exciting um, integration. We've worked very closely with the Slack team. Thank them a lot for making sure for, uh, you know, that um, we work closely with their partnership. In addition, we didn't want to just stop at Slack. We also wanted to make sure that we enhanced our capabilities with Microsoft Teams. Uh, and so if you happen to be a Microsoft Teams user, what you'll start to see is um, that right within the Teams interface at the bottom, you'll be able to now attach a file from Box into the Teams interface. And so that'll be something that's deeply integrated where you can take a Box file and attach it into Teams. And then that will, what they've also done is ensured that the, um, the, the link that you have of the file can also be converted into a preview right within the Teams channel. So you can go through and uh, browse through the file right from within the Teams contact. You don't have to le lose the context of that and move to a different application. Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah? Now, one of the other really big pieces of request we got back was, can you make sure that you tie in the, the folder that you have and the channel that you have so that there's an automatic folder created for the channel with the automatic provisioning of the permissions for that folder so I don't have to manually create a folder every single time I need to make sure I integrate with the Teams channel. And that was a huge kind of request the customers had, so we wanted to make sure that we we enhance that request as well, since so that's now uh, you know, available in the product. Um, and what you'll also be able to see is box files. You'll be able to see the entire navigation view right within your Teams channel of box. If you wanted to navigate your content in Teams right from um, box, you don't have to leave Teams and go into box. You just stay within the Teams context, and you should be able to do it. Because our goal is to make sure that regardless of the application you're using, you should be able to work with content that's in box. Um, and you know, these are kind of uh, capabilities that we built for individual applications, but one of the things we wanted to also focus on was make sure that the overall experience that you get when you're using these integrations in Box also got better and better over time. And so what we've done is we've, uh, uh, we've thought long and hard about how do we make sure that there's better discoverability of applications. So if you have an application that your IT team has sanctioned, how does that show up in your box interface so that you can make sure that you know that this integration is in fact available to me. I have a document that I do want to post into a Slack channel or I do want to initiate a DocuSign workflow with. How do I go about doing that? And so what we've done is we've built this capability called recommended apps. And recommended apps will allow you um, as a uh, customer through our in internal machine learning to be able to surface up the right level of applications that you have sanctioned and approved within your organization as an IT administrator that those integrations have been turned on and they'll be surfaced so that there's better, there's, there's better discoverability of those apps. So we th think of us as when you're thinking about working with a piece of content, all the things you wanted to do with that, app, uh, with, with that piece of content you now have available to you because it'll be easily discoverable. And it's not just that. We want to make sure that we become a content hub while you're working with a piece of content. So you know exactly all that's going on 
with that piece of content within all the applications, not just the application that you're working on, which is Box. And so what we've done is we've also made sure that we've made available, um, you know, the, um, uh, the capability of an activity stream. So you can now, within the activity stream, take a very close look and see exactly what's going on. You posted a document into Slack. You made sure that you tied um, a, um, a document to an opportunity record in Salesforce. You made sure that you initiated a workflow with DocuSign. All of those things are now available to see in the activity stream. And then when you click on one of those activity streams, what you'll start to see is a tremendous amount of integration that's deep linked. So if I click on a Slack channel, um, uh, then it'll take me not just to the Slack channel, but to the exact location where your document appears. So those are the kind of things that we've, um, we've gone out and done. So when you think about what we've just talked about, we've said, let's make sure that we provide you with the most frictionless security and compliance, tied with making sure that you can, work, you, you, you can get your work done in a much more effective way with seamless internal and external collaboration and workflow. And lastly, it's completely integrated into the investments that you've made with an IT ecosystem of cloud vendors. And so to talk and see this in action, I wanted to bring Ray and Jamie on stage so that they can show you a demo. Thank you, G2. Today, we're gonna walk you through an example of how a company working on the latest autopilot sensor technology brings a new product to market. As you all know, introducing new product involves dozens of work streams running in parallel. Whether you're QAing prototypes, iterating on designs, or developing co-marketing plans, these processes have content and collaboration at their core, and both inside and outside the organization. Box securely supports all these work streams, and today we're going to focus on three that Box can simplify. Product design and development, contract review and approval, and sales channel enablement. Let's take a deep dive into the product design and development work stream. When developing new products, protecting sensitive files is critical. Whether you're collaborating internally or externally with partners and suppliers, making sure your IP and proprietary information is safe and secure can be make or break. Having Box as a centralized content system makes us super simple. First, we want to show you how our product design and engineering teams are using Box to securely collaborate internally. So Jamie, the product design team, they've been working really hard in updating the latest sensor diagrams. Let's go take a look at the next-gen sensor, Doc Now. All right. So earlier this year, Box partnered with Autodesk to provide seamless integration with desktop and web applications and file CAD preview. That's right, Ray. You can see here that the team has actually already been collaborating on this document in the right activity stream. Now, obviously, the design for your next-generation sensor is incredibly sensitive content. Luckily, Box Shield makes it easy to set classification and security policies on an individual document. We'll just click Classify in the main menu and get a list of options to choose from. Now, we know from the Shield demo previously that organizations can create their own custom classifications and drive their own sharing and download restrictions all on their own. That's right, Ray. You'll notice we've set up three classifications here, confidential, internal, and public, all using a different combination of Shield's access controls. I'm gonna mark this document as confidential. That means when my external supplier gets to, uh, access to it, they're gonna be able to preview and comment, but they can't actually download our sensitive IP. And Box makes that really easy with a visual cue at the upper left-hand corner for anyone that wants to view that document. Now, you folks, as G2 mentioned, You've asked us to make it easier to share what you're working on in Box in the applications you're using day to day. Our upcoming release of recommended applications streamlines this process by automatically surfacing the most relevant applications based on the file type that you open. So our design team, they're always on Slack pretty much all day. So you can see that it is at the uh, top of the list here. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and share the file with them now to make sure everyone's got the latest updates. You'll notice that if someone in channel doesn't have access to this file, that uh, the new Slack integration is going to let us know, and with, for the first time ever, with just a couple clicks, you will be able to invite them directly from within Slack. Just like that, everyone in channel has access to the file. Hey, Jamie, what about Microsoft Teams? Well, Ray, I've got good news. 
Box already has a Teams integration, and we're gonna be releasing an all new version of it coming up soon. Awesome. <laughs> You'll see, if we head back to Box Preview, that Slack has added an activity event here in the stream, so I always know what's happening to my content, no matter where it's been shared. Now I think this design file is actually good to go. It is time to tag in our manufacturer and get the sensors produced. So to do that, I'm gonna share our manufacturing specifications folder with our external vendor. You'll notice that Box warns me as soon as I add an external email address. So I never share sensitive content unintentionally. In this case, I'm actually not worried. I know our IT department has set up security policies for working with external vendors. Our manufacturer is gonna have to accept a terms of service and set up two-factor authentication all before they can access my sensitive content. So Ray, can you show us what it looks like as an external vendor? No problem, Jamie. So now I'm an external vendor and I've been invited to have access to the manufacturing specifications. Now you see, I have to set up uh, two-factor authentication and accept terms of service. Now this is something that I know everyone has been asking for more control of the content that you are going to share externally. So, let's go ahead and accept that terms of service and set up 2FA. So now, let's focus on how I can work in Box securely as an external vendor. So let's go ahead and look at that next-gen sensor tech spec. Okay. And we'll see, we can see the contextual activity on the right-hand side. Now I can update the document in the tool of my choice whether that's Microsoft Word, Office 365, or Google. All right, now, with our recently updated visual version capabilities, we can now look at previous versions of the document and see what has changed. Now, we know this is, at times has been a tedious process, and we're really excited to make this change for you. Ray, so you're saying I don't have to click through previous versions, set it as my current version, and keep going back and forth until I find what I need? That's right, Jamie. You just click and preview. Fantastic. So now we're gonna go ahead and at mention the design team, and the specs look good to go. All right. So we've now just seen how we can drive secure internal and external collaboration for the product and design team. Next, let's talk about how Box Relay allows anyone to automate critical business processes. Specifically, we're gonna look at contracts review and approvals. At our auto sensor company, the legal team decided to standardize the co-marketing agreements process. This is something that was previously happening in email. We had a lot of files moving back and forth, and it was really hard to keep track of. So, Box Relay allowed us to turn that into four consistently repeatable and better trackable steps. Everything kicks off when some assets and an agreement are uploaded to Box. From there, Relay is going to send a task over to the GC for review. And if everything looks good, send the file along to our general manager for a final check. If she approves, we'll go ahead and move the file directly to our executed contracts folder where a retention policy is automatically applied. Now we're working with lots of co-marketing partners, so I'm gonna create a file request link to allow anyone to upload content directly to my co-marketing agreements folder, all without needing a Box account. I just maybe send it out an email, and when a partner receives it, all they have to do is drag and drop files, add an email address, and maybe click Upload, and from there, everything is gonna land on Box. Jamie, that is a great way to share content between companies without resorting to email, and it works great for large files, too. That's right, Ray, and even better, using a file request link, make sure that the content lands in the right folder so my Relay workflow always gets kicked off. Now, our general counsel is gonna be notified that there's new agreement for review with a badge in the top right on the Task Center. We launched the Task Center as part of our all new Tasks and Notifications experience earlier this year so that you'd have a single place in Box to find all of your work. And the updated Notification Center lets you much more easily keep track of relevant activities that are happening to your content on Box. 
RGC could uh, go ahead and approve the agreement right here, but realistically, we should probably click, open it in preview, and actually take a look at the terms. So we're gonna just do a quick scroll through here, and since everything looks good, we're gonna approve and send the file along to our general manager. So the general manager, she is never in the office. She's always traveling. So she uses Box primarily on her mobile device. Now with Box's new push notifications, she's gonna an alert every single time a task is assigned. Tapping on that task, she'll be taken to the new mobile task center. And from there, by looking at the task, she'll be able to easily review the document and approve it right there on her mobile device. And just like that, our approvals process is actually complete. Relay is gonna move that file to our executed contracts folder where retention policy is applied. For those of you in the audience who are in highly regulated industries or who have compliance needs, Box Relay is a great way to make sure your sensitive content that moves through a workflow always ends up in the right place with the right policy applied. So we've seen what Relay looks like from an end user experience, but maybe Ray can take us behind the scenes and walk through how easy it was to configure. I would love to, Jamie. So here we're looking at the details of the workflow we just reviewed. And the first thing you'll notice is that this workflow designer is different than every single workflow tool on the market. We're able to create simple and intuitive workflows based purely on triggers and outcomes. No more complex workflow charts that require IT to update, update existing flows. So if we look on the left-hand side, we can see the existing flow. We've got a new file uploaded, two general tasks, and then we're moving that file over to an archive folder. So we know this is very easy to look at an existing flow, and we know that processes are always changing or can be updated. So now let's maybe make a change to this existing workflow and see what we can do. What do you think we should change, Ray? Mm -hmm. I'm, about, I'm wondering, actually, how are we gonna find this contract later when it comes up for renewal? Hmm. Let's use metadata and drive the contract expiration policy and apply it. How's metadata gonna help us here? Well, we all know that it's difficult to find the content right now, what you need, when you need it. But if we go ahead and use metadata in Box, it becomes searchable and you can find content at any time. Okay, that sounds great, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, so let's go ahead and add that metadata outcome. We'll go ahead and choose the metadata we want me to apply. In this case, it's gonna be the contract expiration policy. Once we apply that metadata, we are good to go. The changes are live. So the next time that we apply this workflow, we're gonna be able to see the changes right away and the contract expiration policy or metadata will be applied right to that document. That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> yes, nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> so you've just seen how Box allows anyone to easily automate a critical business process, something that's often managed in email, and make it repeatable and trackable in just a few minutes. All right, so now let's focus on how we can make sales channel enablement seamless. So we have the marketing team. They've been working in Box internally, and they're working on updating all the product design assets. So now we're gonna use Box platform and publish all that same content to Salesforce communities. By doing that, all the external, external channel partners will now be able to access the latest and greatest content all within Box, with no extra work from the marketing team. All right, as Ray mentioned, the marketing team at our out of sensor company, they work in Box every day. They've got an assets folder, they're creating collateral and tech specs for each new product release. Now, they wanted to make that easily available to channel partners, so they've worked with an internal dev team, used Box platform, and built a custom portal on Salesforce communities. That portal is linked directly to this folder, so the marketing team can continue to work as they always have day-to-day -day in box and publish content to the channel partners at any time. How about we take a look at that channel partner experience, Ray? Sounds good. So now I'm logged into the Salesforce Communities Portal, and I can see that I have access to all the sales enablement materials that were published originally in Box. Now, using uh, Box Platform Elements, I can search and find all the content that is relevant to me. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and find that pitch deck 
and, and look at it. Uh, once I click it on, I can view that document right from within the site or choose to download it if I need to. So we all know that Box is committed to support an open API and drive a superior development experience for all our developers. Using Box Platform, we can integrate with almost any platform like Salesforce Communities, uh, Amazon, Google, Oracle, and developers can build a simple experience and embed Box content in their own custom applications. Ray, that sounds much simpler than building custom applications from scratch. You're right, Jamie. But compared to other platforms, Box makes it easy to leverage your content anywhere. All right, so now we've gone through and seen how we can make sales channel enablement seamless. So let's zoom back out and review what we've covered. We've shown you three examples of how Box supports the new product introduction process. You've seen how Shield and Box's best of breed integrations allow you to collaborate inside and outside the organization securely. We used Box Relay and Box Governance to show a high value business process and how we could take the contract and re review and approval workflow and make it secure and trackable within minutes. And we use Box Platform to streamline sales channel enablement, allowing the marketing team to publish content to Salesforce communities with no extra work, seamlessly. Remember though, these are just three processes that run in new product introduction. And new product introduction is one of hundreds of work streams you folks are managing every day. Box can help power them all. And with that, I'd like to invite G2 back to the stage to uh, close us out. So what did you folks think? Was that, was that really cool? <laughs> Woo! So if there's one thing that I think you're not going to forget about this keynote, it's this slide. Um, but let me take a step further and just kind of sum it up for you on what you saw over here. So you saw basically Box Enterprise with core collaboration capabilities um, um, that were demoed. You also saw Box Shield, which, we've, which we are releasing at the end of the month. You saw Box Governance, uh, which is our governance tool for compliance. You saw Box Relay. Uh, which goes out and solves very, very specific workflows for, you know, kind of review and approval as well as onboarding and offboarding. And you also saw platform integrating into every single app that you have. And what we wanted to do was make sure that we make this easy um, to work with. So we've also ensured that this gets tied into two very easy to consume suites for you. So you've got a digital workplace suite and a digital business suite so that you can make sure that rather than going out and buying everything individually, you can just buy it in the suite. And this is, um, uh, th this is incredibly important because it's tied to what we're hearing from customers around the business processes that you're trying to drive. Modern ways of enabling a digital workplace for collaborating securely from anywhere and being able to drive digital business processes across the enterprise. So we want to make this as, as easy as possible to, uh, to be able to implement in your business. Um, I, I was actually getting some text backstage uh, from, from, from folks in the audience um, uh, and, uh, and others online. Um, uh, what, wh so when, how do I get these suites? When, when can I actually get them? H how does this work? Is there a simple way that I can, what, what payment methods are, are we accepting? How does this work? What, what, what payment methods? Apple Pay, Venmo? Be uh, Apple Pay and Venmo, okay, great. And then uh, maybe ACH. No, I'm fucking okay. kidding, man. Oh, it's like kidding. You, okay, you have to call okay. your representative okay. Okay. and then they'll oh, make sure it. that they Do we take Bitcoin at this point or not? No, it's, that's oh, on the roadmap. Okay, got it, okay. It's on the roadmap. Um, so anyway, thank you folks for taking the time uh, to listen to the story and hopefully what we are doing is solving problems that are the most important to you. Thank you to all the sponsors for making sure that this event was possible and we've got a great couple of days ahead of us so make sure we that you get into the details. Go to the booth, make sure that you see the detailed demos uh, and uh, text Aaron backstage Keep if you texting have other me. things. And, uh, and we want to hear from you. Uh, again, our roadmap and as G2 and I have, have conveyed, our roadmap is really driven by our partnership with all of you. So the more feedback that you give us around your business processes, what's transforming in your enterprise, that is what drives our product strategy and our product roadmap. So the what next couple of days we want to hear from you around what more you want to see and hopefully you, uh, you, you get a lot of exciting updates as well. One last thing. Uh, if um, you know, we are very grateful to have you as our customers. We're also very grateful for all the people at Box that put a lot of hard work to make sure that these things were possible. So one big round of applause for all the people at Box. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll, uh, you. we'll see you back this afternoon and over the next couple of days. Thank you.